Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Spring is a good time to make major changes to the landscape, but before you pick up the shovel, you should have a plan. Today, we are going to show how to create a new design for your beds. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I am Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Joellen Diamond. Joellen is the Director of Landscape at the University of Memphis. All right, Joellen, this is going to be fun. Uh-huh. Let's talk about drawing a landscape design. Yes. So, um, well, where we know, start? There, there's a lot of places you can start. Okay. Um, of course, the first thing when I we had mentioned before, you got to be able to have a, a, a tape measure to right. to measure the, your area, so you'll know the kind of uh, the dimensions that you're working okay. with. Uh, and then you can do this on a plain piece of paper, or you can use a tablet. There's lots of different programs that you can do to put circles and things around here. Uh, it just whatever you want to, to use uh, your medium. I do both, okay. but I typically like just <laughs> a graph paper. Okay. Graph paper is the easiest to use because the little squares can be your your uh, one foot. One square equals one foot. Okay. One foot square. Oh, that's easy. Or you can okay. do one right. uh, one square equals two feet square. Okay. I mean, it's however long your your design is and how you can use the graph paper to, you know, okay. use the dimensions of what you have. Um, you can get as technical as you want. There's T-squares oh. here. There's architectural uh, uh, rulers, regular rulers. You can have uh, triangles, circle templates, uh, whatever you want. Uh, but, you know, even a protractor with a straight edge is easy to, to draw with. And I like to use... Um, uh, the circle template for many things, not only for straight edges, but I like to help with my curves, drawing my curves with them. Now, the one thing you have to, to know about uh, the curves, you can draw it on the, your paper all you want, but when it comes to the actual world, you may have to go outside, and if you're putting curves or anything in, I highly recommend you mow the lawn. <laughs> Because if you can't mow the edge, I did. I learned this is the hard way. If you, you can't mm -hmm. mow the edge that you've created, then you're going to create yourself more problems because you have to go back with the weed eaters oh, or do anything. Wow, so okay. yeah, set set your design out. You, you know, you have it on paper. You're going to say, well, let's see how it works out in the real world. And if you can't mow that edge, you're going to have to tweak the, the curves. <laughs> tweak it. How about that? Okay. Tweak the curves. Think about that. Okay. Tweak the curves. <laughs> Um, so, and, and you know, one of the things, we have a finished product of, we did out front, mm -hmm. and that landscape, this is the same process that I used for that landscape design. Right. It's a great design. So we, mm -hmm. we, we, we measured it, we found the area that we needed, then we researched to figure out, we, we did the percolation test and yeah, knew sure mm -hmm. that we had a drainage problem there. So then we used plants that would like full sun, because that's a full sun area, mm -hmm. and would like to have wet roots. Okay. We drew it on a piece of paper. So that's how we came up with that design, and that's the process that you go through. After you and your family have determined, oh, well, this is what we want the yard to look like, or this is what the front, I want my front to look like, or something like that, and you looked at it from the street, you say, hey, uh, I don't want to block the door. I don't want to block, you know, the view, view of my door or anything. Maybe I want the tree out in the yard, mm -hmm. a, a small tree. And maybe I want a small planting out in the yard. And I don't really don't want anything up next to my house. Right. I mean, insect the people would really like that because they don't like to have shrubs up against the house. And right. plants do better not crammed up against a house. I agree, because what? Air circulation. air circulation. There's just no air That's circulation right. up there. That's right. And you don't want to block the windows either, right? No, you Do don't you? want to block windows okay. either. Uh -uh. Okay. Uh, but there's there's many different ways to 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 uh, do this design. And one of the things that you really want to think of 
uh, are the design elements. You have to have design elements in any design that you do. And some of those are lines. Lines can be curves, they can be horizontal, they can be vertical, and there's tons of different plants that can have combinations of that can fit those elements. Um, also, you know, you got to take your structures and your hardscapes into consideration because I mean, do you want to, if you have a back patio or a back deck, how do you want to plants to be around that? Do you want them out in the yard so you can see them? Or do you want them closer to you at, at you know, on the deck or on the patio? Just different ways that you can think of where you want the plants to go. Okay. And of course, you want some unity and harmony, meaning the style you pick. I mean, you might like a Japanese garden with some <laughs> rocks and all that, but if, if the style of your house and or the backyard that you have where you want to put this doesn't fit that, maybe you don't want to put that in your yard, or maybe you want to change their whole yard to that. I mean, it, it's all up to you. It, it's, there's no right or wrong to any of this. Okay. But you do have to remember about scale and proportion. Scale and the proportion has to do with the plants with each other and in scale and proportion to their surroundings or structures that you're going to put them next to. So you've got to think of that. Large trees, there's very few places large trees go in uh, an urban setting. There are, you know, you can have a few here and there, mm -hmm. but remember, uh, if you have a zero lot line house and you put a large oak tree oh, in your backyard, yeah you're not going to have anything else there because right. it's going to take up the whole yard. Right. So you've got to think, you know, in, in harmony, and you know, the proportions uh, for, for all of that. Okay. Uh, then, of course, all plants have forms. You know, some of them, you know, are very loose, like ornamental grass is very loose and wispy. Others are round like boxwoods <laughs> and, and hollies right. and formal. You can have a formal, if you want a formal yard, you're going to think lining up things and you're going to think the same amount on each side and this, you know, that's a formal type of setting. Mm -hmm. uh, informal, asymmetrical would be, you know, a few here and there, groups of threes and fives and sevens and that's what you want to think of, groups of threes and fives and sevens. Mm -hmm. uh, because it visually looks better in groups like that. Odd numbers so look better. I, I was wondering that. Yeah, well, I, think I, I don't know seven. why, but yeah. for some reason it just looks mm. better to us in odd odd groups. Right. Hmm. Odd groupings. Okay. Um, of course, textures. You know, if you have all the same textured plants, even though they're different plants, it's not going to do anything for you visually. So, what you're going to need is some coarse textured plants, some medium textured plants, and some very fine textured plants. And we kind of did that outside because we had the, the magnolias mm. that have large leaves. Okay. We used the Florida anise that has okay. large leaves. We used the uh, spirea mm -hmm. that has, and the hollies that have kind of a small to medium leaf. And then we used the vase shaped forms of the sweet grass right. and the daylilies. Gotcha. So we had all these different kinds of textures. And color is another thing. Mm -hmm. The sweet mm -hmm. flag grass is yellow. And then the flowers on the shrubs bloom at different times and are different colors. So you have a full mm -hmm. color is good for four seasons. And if you can get a plant that is a four season plant with interest, <laughs> oh, and then it, your landscape naturally changes throughout the year without you having to do anything. And what better way of uh, uh, have yeah. save time than that? Yeah. Because you got your I'm plants you. are working for you. That's right. Um, and then of course you got to remember light and sound. Light meaning, you know, put some landscape lights out at night so you can enjoy your your uh, uh, plants at night, either from the street looking at your house or maybe in the backyard around where you're going to be entertaining all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, has some lights pointing up into some of the shrubs or trees. It really gives depth to the, your your landscaped area for you to enjoy. And of course, sound. You can always use a small bubbling uh, oh, fountain yeah, of some those. kind. Either some people put it around their front doors. Mm -hmm. There's others yeah. that have them on their patios in the back. Some kind of, of water movement in can, gives you nice sound. Also. That's why a lot of people use ornamental grasses. Ornamental grasses are a good substitute for water in the landscape mm. because they have a lot of movement. Anytime the wind blows, the, the leaves of the ornamental grasses move, which mimics the movement of water. Sure. 
And of course, in the wintertime, they rustle. Oh, yeah, like, and you know, I love it's, them in the it's so you get all of these yeah. different seasons of change right. in your yard without having changed anything. Right. I, yeah, I love that in the wintertime. And, and the color doesn't bother me, you mm -hmm. know, that it's brown. Uh, no. So yeah, I, I just like that in the landscape. I think that's good. So, th so that's what we, that's what you start. You got to think of all of these elements, and if you if you look here, there's triangular shapes are always good, and then you draw things with mature sizes in mind of each plant, and you put them together as the birds look at okay. it. But then when you look down at the bottom, you'll see, oh, well, these three, they were large, tall plants. These were medium-sized plants, and those were small plants. But you can't tell that from Chicken. this view, but, this, but the, the other view does show you that. And you can do that, and a lot of these landscape design programs on the computer will, will actually have plants you can you know, put in the, in the landscape to do that. Um, I just, I, I know the plants, so I, I don't, I don't have to do that to visualize it because I, I know the plants enough that I know this one's going to be tall and narrow and I want them what this here and want this a shorter one in right. front and, and all of that. But you don't have to do that. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times you don't always want the tall thing in the back. Okay. Sometimes the tall thing can be just in the middle and then the other plants can go around it at different heights. Okay. And it doesn't have to be you know, you don't have to so do stair be, steps. Right, you, don't, okay, you don't have to okay. do a stair step at the back, the tall, then shorter, and then, okay, then ground cover. No, mix it up. The more you mix it up, the more depth it's going to be to your landscape, and the more you're going to enjoy it. Wow. So you really have to do your homework when it comes down to knowing the mature sizes of, the plants. You know, of your plants. Yeah, I mean, you can see plants in the landscape and say, oh, I really like that. And then you find out, oh, that's, that is a, a little bit too tall for mm -hmm. my area. So maybe what you want to do is create another area where that could okay. go in okay. your landscape. Okay. But yeah, you, you just have to do some research when you see some plants and, and mm -hmm. know that the mature size is to be able to draw it on your plan. Okay, so since you just mentioned draw, why don't we draw something? Sure. Right. Now if we take this as... Uh, uh, one of these squares equals two feet, okay. so I've got four four feet here. So if I look at this, and I've got a plant that gets up to four feet, which is most shrubs. Okay. Um, so I would be saying, well, I want to do an odd number of them. So I'm going to put one here, and you usually put a, a dot to the center. I want to do two here. So what's the dot in the center? For. This, that's, the, that's the center of where the, it's planted. Okay, okay. So you can look at this and say, oh, well, this is four feet, so two feet in is where uh -huh. I want the center gotcha. of my plant to be. Okay. And, and then you can just keep, keep drawing a few of them. I'm going to put another one over here. And there's kind of an angle going here. Ah, I see it. Okay. And, and then you say, well, I want a whole bunch of littler plants, but I think I'm going to put them over here. So you draw them in, and you got five there. Again, threes, fives. Okay, and those are smaller? Smaller right? plants. So, so give us an example of a smaller plant that you would be thinking about. Uh, I'm, I would think that these would, I'm, I would say these are, are dwarf boxwood, okay. Okay. and these are variegated liriopes. Oh, okay. So you then, then I've got some dark evergreen, and then I've got a, a seasonal color that's, that's variegated all year long. Okay. And I'll put one more here. And this is assuming that this is south. Ah, got to get the directions. Okay. This is uh, north. Okay. So I've got hot sun blazing on the front of this, whatever this is. Okay. And so I'm going to need something that will take the hot sun. Which is why it's so important to know the directions. Right. 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 Yes. Because our suns are, the sun is brutal here. Yes, it is. Of course, and shelter. It mm -hmm. is. And, and say, that, well, I say I've got a plant here, um, and it's a little bit bigger. So I'm going to say this one gets about six feet round. And it's going to be a hydrangea that takes ah, the sun. Okay. Okay. 
to get me some color in. And then I probably would put some more, balance this out by putting, repeating a few of these over here. Make sure you keep the right circle you're, you're working with. <laughs> So then I have three over there, and then I might put, again, some more of the small. Again, nothing in a straight line, very free-formed. So you talk about the free-form, right? Yeah. So how do you put all that together, though, you know, to create the balance that you were talking about? Well, like this is, these are variegated, so that's why sometimes it's good to do a color. Ah. That's why when I, I end up coloring things at the okay. end, because you've got these as one color. And you've got these as a different color. Okay. And sometimes I just put crosses on them. So you end up with this random pattern that is balanced. Hmm with the harmony because you've got, you're repeating some of the same plants around. Because if this, obviously this is not very large. The smaller it is, like you, maybe you, we out front, how many plants did we have? We had oh. one, two, three, four, five, six. We had basically seven different varieties of plants okay. with the cannas. Okay. Right, right, okay. So, okay. you know, I wouldn't want to do more than five to seven different varieties of different plants with different colors and different textures in this uh, design so that it would, gotcha. it would be harmonious. Yeah, and the five and seven is the odd. And the five ah. to seven is the odd oh, okay. number. got it, okay, okay. To, be, to go with it. Sure. And if I have enough room, I might get and repeat my hydrangeas over here if I have enough room. So then I would end up with two hydrangeas over here to end up with three hydrangeas all together. About that. So yeah, and then you just, uh, then to fill in. Then I think there's enough room for something else, like maybe some daylilies or some okay. perennials through here. Maybe there's there spots for leaf spots for annuals. Right. So that's a yeah discussion so about just, using annuals and yeah, perennials. Okay. So that's so why you would in. mix all of that up, and yet it would be harmonious. And there's the right now there's one, two, there's three different kinds of plants here right now. And if I used an annual, that could be four, and then and then another hmm. perennial like a daylily or something that could be five, and I'd be done. Hmm, okay. So how do you determine which plants do well together, though? Uh, because they all have the same uh, moisture requirements. Okay, got it. Yeah, okay. and this is going to, I'm going for something that that's, likes to be hot and dry. And dry, okay. I got it. And I guess on your plan here, you would show where, you know, there's maybe some underground wire and, you know, the structures and... Yeah, if, like if I had called, you know, and got yeah. the utilities all, there, maybe there's a plumbing coming into sure. the house right here. Okay. What if the plumbing is coming into the house right here? Well, see, that's why you wouldn't want to put annuals right here, because gotcha. it'd be easier mm. to, to move if you had to, to get the plumbing in the house. Hmm. I know what somebody's going to be thinking, though. Okay. see the plan. How do you determine what you plant first? Um... It, I usually plant the bigger stuff and work my way okay. down. Okay. It's just a lot easier to because it, it takes more effort and it's early in the morning and I want to get the, <laughs> right. the large stuff in the ground right. first. Right. And as as the day is waning on, then it's easier to plant the smaller stuff around okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And make sure you get all that watered in. You'll be good. All of it watered right. in. Right. Yes. Right. And of course you're going to do your soil test ahead of time. Soil right? test, <laughs> uh, see if it needs any fertilizer. Then I, I, I would hardly recommend putting mycorrhizae down. Oh wow, yeah. Because so that because there's a symbiotic relationship between the mycorrhizae, micronutrients good, in the good. soil, and and everything will be happy. Everything will be happy. Mm -hmm. But Julie, you just made us happy. That's pretty cool to see an actual plan mm -hmm. uh, in the works. Mm -hmm. So thank you much. We appreciate that. Native plants. Oh, that's another one that there's a lot of confusion mm -hmm. about when do we say it's a native? Yes. You know, and, and I can give you a whole bunch of definitions, <laughs> but I think the one that is most reasonable and the one that would make the most sense would be a plant that 
grows naturally in a particular area, an ecosystem or a habitat or region of the country without indirect or direct human intervention. Mm. It was there originally. And if we, when we talk about the eastern United States and we talk about native plants in the eastern part of the country, those are the plants that were here when the Europeans came. Mm. Okay. Gotcha. And that's the sort of the standard definition of a native plant in the eastern part of, of our country is what was here, growing here naturally when the Europeans first came. All right, Joel, and this is our Q&A segment. You ready? I'm ready. These are great questions. Sounds right. good. Here's our first video email. I have a brown turkey fig and the fruit goes moldy on the inside before it ripens. Why are my figs not getting ripe? Please help Fab Ian on YouTube. Yes. Brown turkey fig, delicious fig. Delicious. Yeah, know all about that. Gorgeous. But they're moldy in the inside before they ripen. So what do we think about that? Um, well, you know, figs actually ripen from the inside right. out. Right. So they right. might be they're trying to let it get, you know, ripe on the outside, but by the time it does that, it's on the staying outside on the tree, it's moldy on the inside. Mm -hmm. So I would, you usually pick figs and they're still not quite, not quite right, right. ripe yet. So mm -hmm. you want to p pull them off the tree before they ripen. Right. Um, but you know, it could be a cultivar problem too. It could be, it could be. that it's too wet there because wetness you know, in the ground, the roots, uh, this is not good for figs. Figs like to be on the dry side. Figs love good, well-drained soil, yes. as we know. Again, we talked about the cultivars. Mm -hmm. Some take a couple of more months than others to ripen. Mm -hmm. Figs do not like any type of stress. No. Mm -mm. None? Yeah. All right. So I think a lot of what we talked about could be the issue with that. Yeah. And then, too, we don't know what time of the year. Right. Just He's true. talking about. We don't know. We don't know what cultivars he and has. We don't know the cultivars, right? But something else too that delays ripening. Cool days, and short days, mm -hmm. right? Or cool nights, short days. Yeah. Right. Can delay ripening. So, some things it, to think about. It, it is th something to think about. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you know, when he doesn't, he needs to start, uh, you know, harvesting them before the outside is you know, what he considers ripe. Right. Yeah, just a little bit before it gets ripe. Yeah, I can remember Grandma doing that. Sitting on the counter for a little bit, they'd be ready to go. Yeah. Ready to go. All right, Fab, we hope that helps you out there. All right, here's our next viewer email. Our cherry blossom tree was struck by lightning last year. This year, it still blossomed. Can a tree struck by lightning stay healthy? Mrs. Terry from Conyers, Georgia. Interesting question. It is. So, can a tree struck by lightning, can it Still grow with you know. It depends. Be healthy? Y yes, it can. Okay. It depends yeah. on how severe mm -hmm. the lightning strike was. Okay. I mean, I've seen some trees that were struck by lightning where their bark was blown off. I've seen that. And you know, they're immediately like dead. Right. Uh, but if this one is still alive, it might have a streak where the lightning can, went down to the ground in it. And if it did. I would make sure that I kept that sprayed with insecticides. Oh, uh, yeah. Because that's going to be a yeah. weak, the tree is mm -hmm. weakened, which might be why it blooms so beautifully. Mm. Uh, so it, you need to make sure the bugs don't enter yes. the bark through that. So keep that sprayed with an insecticide. All right. Uh, and then, of course, fertilize it. That's what I would do. You know, I'm just once a year in the spring, I, I wouldn't go crazy with the yeah. fertilizer. But you just want to make sure it's yeah. alive. And I only, only do that for one or two years. I mean, it's not going to need any more than that because it's going to try to heal over if, mm -hmm. if there is a wound in it. Yeah, I, I definitely fertilize because, yeah, tree struck by lightning, mm -hmm. stressed. Mm -hmm. It's going to be stressed severely, right? Yes. Because the nutrients are going to get sapped, yes. you know, from the lightning strike. So I would get out there as soon as I could with some fertilizer, get it watered in, yes. right, so the roots can take it up and see what happens. Mm -hmm. right? And you're right about the insect pests and the Diseases. Diseases too. You know, it's going to be another issue as well. So, yeah, you want to keep your eye on that for sure because that tree is stressed and weakened, mm -hmm. you know, from that lightning strike. So, And ugh. bugs are, oper and, and diseases Ooh. are opportunistic and they see mm -hmm. a something in stress and they'll go to that. Right, right. Might be a good idea to call a certified arborist, you know, could just to have them to come be. out and, you know, take a look and assess the overall, you know, tree health and, and see. 
sure. you know, if it can be saved. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I would go that route as well. But yeah, that tree's going to be stressed severely. But I've seen some of those uh, trees struck by lightning live. For many I years. I, I sure have. All right, so thank you for that question. Uh, here's our next viewer email. <laughs> Hello, we found this weed growing in our yard. What is it? This is Bethany from Jackson, Tennessee. Oh, Miss Bethany, guess what that is? Cut leaf evening primrose. That's what so that is. It's a wildflower. It's a wildflower. It looks beautiful. You know, um, deep tap root system, okay? Mm -hmm. Has the tooth lobed alternate leaves. Yeah. Right? Beautiful flower. The flower is like a yellow pinkish color. You know, it looks pretty in the picture. I absolutely love that flower, right? But it's versatile. This wildflower can either be a winter annual, a summer annual, or a biennial. Oh, wow. So how about that? So you can enjoy the beautiful blooms. Usually it blooms first in the spring and then later in the fall. Mm -hmm, in the cooler weather. In the cooler weather, yeah. So you can have those blooms year round. Right? Yeah. Winter annual, summer annual, or biennial. Well, so think neat. about that. I need wildfire or something else. Yes. Yeah. So cut leaf evening primrose. Mm -hmm. Right. And you usually see them out in, I usually see them in pasture areas, uh, side of the road. Uh, I live across from a wooded area, so it's a little, uh, I see it on the side of the road there, you know, as you get into the woods. Uh, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I like to see it. Very good. So Bethany, there you have a beautiful wildfire. Enjoy it. Jordan, this was fun. Yes, it was. Thank you much. Thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. Joellen showed us how to design a garden bed on paper. If you want to see how to turn that design into a reality, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.